All right, next up. He's a senior fellow at the Policy Political Economy, uh, in Political Economy at the Independent Institute. He edit, edits their quarterly journal, The Independent Review. I'm sure you've seen this publication. Um, he is the winner of uh, the most prestigious prize that the Mises Institute awards. That's the Gary S. Slarbaum Prize for Lifetime Achievement in the Cause of Liberty. He is the 2007 winner of that prize. He's written a number of books against Leviathan, uh, Depression, War, and the Cold War. Uh, one that is especially near and dear to my heart is this one called Crisis and Leviathan. And uh, if you don't think that is a good book, uh, none other than Murray Rothbard would assign that in his US economic history class. So there is no greater endorsement for a book than that. So we have it on sale. And he is here. He can autograph it. He is also going to talk to you today about ethanol subsidies and many, many bad consequences. Robert Higgs. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in Indianapolis today and uh, an experiment as well because I'm going to, uh, to talk to you about the, the ethanol program. <clears throat> and uh, some of its uh, causes and consequences. And, and, and this is a, a talk I've never given before, so you, you may consider yourselves guinea pigs. Uh, often people invite me to give talks because they, they, they're aware that I, I know something about a certain topic and they want me to talk about that. And of course, that's something I've, I've talked about before, sometimes many times, and I, I, I have the feeling at, at times that I, I, I'm like this broken record that just keeps spinning the same groove over and over and over. And, and uh, uh, so I'm hoping to uh, have a good time with you guinea pigs talking about something I've ne never discussed publicly before. However, as a prelude to that, I will uh, spend a, a little time talking about some of the principles that I think are helpful in understanding the ethanol program, why it exists at all, and and why it uh, continues in spite of uh, all the horrors that it produces. And uh, th these are elements of public choice or political economy uh, that apply to many different uh, uh, government programs. And uh, it turns out that uh, the ethanol program is a kind of poster child. These principles are especially evident uh, when we look at that that program, but they're, um, they're generally uh, visible in many other government programs as well. Uh, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, the government ag policy has been around in this country for a long time. It actually began before the war between the states when the patent office was giving away seeds to farmers, and then uh, later on, of course, the Department of Agriculture uh, took over and expanded that uh, kind of activity and added others. And then the state experiment stations were created in the 1880s. And uh, I always remember a story about uh, the, the extension agent going out and finding the old farmer out in his field and came over the fence. He says, "I'm from I'm from the I'm the extension agent for the county." I'm, uh, I'm here to tell you how you, you can farm better. And the farmer says, uh, I don't need you. You're wasting your time. I already know how to farm better than I am. <laughs> that was a kind of joke. I grew up on a farm, so <laughs> the extension agent was really not that, that much of a, uh, a welcome figure when he came around to farms. Uh, Farmers, farmers always knew a lot more than the, the extension agent did, but at all events, uh, we've, we've got uh, many different forms of agricultural subsidies uh, from giving away things such as seeds and, and nowadays giving away all sorts of things to, to subsidies that take uh, countless forms, price supports, uh, conservation set-aside payments, uh, 
uh, guarantees of uh, making up the difference between loan loans issued and crop values and you name it. So it just goes on and on and on. And even the ag uh, economists have trouble, I think, keeping up with this. And I, I want to second uh, uh, what uh, Tom DiLorenzo said about uh, Zeke Pesar. Uh, he really is excellent, and uh, I want to add to it that uh, one of my PhD students uh, from the days when I taught at the University of Washington, uh, Randy Rucker, who teaches at Montana State University, has, has become a co-author with Zeke, and uh, so they now have a, a book together, which is the best book I know of. I uh, really believe this is far and away the best book you could read about uh, agricultural economics and the role of government policy in it, uh, Pesar and Rucker, and um, that that happens to be one of the books uh, produced by the Independent Institute with which with which I'm affiliated. But first point I want to make to you is when the government goes out and uh, in, in injects itself into the market system or the price system. Uh, it never does just one thing. It can't go in there with kind of a surgical strike, as they would say in the Defense Department. Uh, even though the main intention may be one thing, such as raising the price of corn to a higher level than it would achieve if we didn't put the government in, into the market, uh, it, if, even if that succeeds, and especially, in fact, if it succeeds, uh, other things are going to be affected. And, uh, uh, of course, this is no secret to the people who exert influence on the making of ag policy. And, in fact, historically, some of the, some of the guiltiest parties behind agricultural policy making are, are not farmers at all. Uh, but people associated with farming industries in some way, especially as uh, suppliers of farm products, uh, as uh, banks that make loans to farmers, uh, as purchasers of farm products, and so forth. Uh, farming is part of the, the great division of labor, and it's associated with a lot of other interests, and oftentimes those interests uh, have more clout in policymaking than the farmers themselves. Uh, uh, one of the good illustrations of that uh, was that when, when the Agricultural Adjustment Act was passed in 1933 and uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration was created to administer the act, the, the government had to appoint somebody and it appointed a man named George Peak. Peak was not a farmer. Peak had been the president of the Moline Plow Company. But of course, all of these equipment companies understood that if something could be done by the government to give higher incomes to farmers, uh, they would in turn, as, uh, as, as Doug was suggesting in his talk about the uh, history of Kansas, they would use some of that higher income to buy equipment. And so uh, the equipment manufacturers were part of the politicking that, that gave rise to this first great attempt to to have uh, widespread, uh, detailed government planning of agricultural output and prices uh, from 1933 on. There, there have been countless changes over the years in, in, in the details of the ag programs, but, but in many ways there's been continuity all the, all the way from 1933 to the present. So that's, that's principle number one. Uh, you can't do just one thing when you intervene. You're going to affect a lot of other things. And because of that, uh, people who have other interests besides farming are going to become players in policy making. Uh, a second principle uh, relates to, to what is sometimes called the, the bootleggers and Baptists model. And uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, but uh, if you haven't, I'll give you a quick rundown. Uh, Bruce Yandel, uh, an old friend of mine who teaches at Clemson, or, 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 or is still associated with Clemson, I, I'm not sure he's still teaching actively, but Bruce came up with the idea uh, that a lot of policy making may appear on the surface to be the result of uh, ideological zealotry 
or even religious zealotry. So that uh, in the case of uh, prohibitions against alcohol sales, on, uh, in many uh, states, even after the end of national prohibition, and before national prohibition for that matter, many states and, and local government jurisdictions prohibited uh, sales of uh, alcoholic beverages, or, or they restricted sales, such as not allowing sales on Sunday, even if it were legally permissible on other days of the week. So uh, Br Bruce said, uh, we've got the Baptists, and they appear to be the ones that are, that are backing these alcohol uh, prohibitions. And sure enough, you know, the Baptists weren't, weren't uh, ashamed of their faith. They would be very happy to stand up in public or even in, in a, a meeting of the state legislature, or the county council or whatever, and, and, and say, you know, that's what we want you to do. We want you to clamp down on these alcohol sales. They're, 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 they're bad for people's morality and so forth. So it looked as if this, this was something that was completely non-economic. Uh, but, you know, one, one of the good rules for understanding public policy, <laughs> any kind of public policy in this country, is follow the money. And so if you followed the money behind these uh, alcohol prohibitions, uh, you might soon come in places like the South, where there were lots of Baptists and they therefore had some political clout, uh, you would find the bootleggers. Because whenever government forbids uh, a commerce in some good or service that people really demand, uh, people are going to look for a way to satisfy their demands. And if they have to do so illegally, well, that's what they do. So when you make prohibitions on commerce and alcoholic beverages, you have, you have bootleggers. And of course, during prohibition in the 1920s, we had a tremendous involvement of organized crime. Because, you know, they stand ready to involve themselves in illegal activities. That's what they do. That's how, in large part, they make their money. So, so Bruce said what happens here is you have a de facto alliance. The bootleggers and the Baptists are, in fact, pushing for the same thing. The bootleggers want these alcohol prohibitions because that's what spills over into a demand for their supplies. If alcohol sales were completely legal, people would probably buy it, you know, it's cheap legal sellers rather than maybe paying a little more for bootleg product, which is higher priced because there's risk associated with producing and distributing an illegal product. And, and that adds to the, to the cost and, and to the ultimate price of the product. So, so a lot of times you have bootleggers and Baptists uh, working, uh, and this has become a metaphor. And in the case of the ethanol program, you, you had originally a lot of uh, environmentalists, and they were, they were the Baptists here because uh, they looked like zealots that despised the automobile, and they despised the internal combustion, and they despised petroleum and its products, all of which were connected with what they viewed as the uh, despoiling the planet. So they wanted to somehow uh, get away from uh, uh, the automobile and the truck and all of these things that were creating air pollution by, uh, by, by, by producing exhaust gases from uh, petroleum products. Well, okay, whenever you have Baptists, you, you attract uh, opportunists. So when the ethanol Baptists said, you know, we, we want public programs that will result in substituting ethanol for petroleum-based fuel, well, sure enough, people that saw a chance to produce alternative fuels rushed into that opening and made their own voices known in the political process, made their own money felt by the politicians who had some power to decide these policies. So now we've got our own uh, bootleggers and Baptists uh, in the ethanol uh, situation. All those people who produce ethanol or indirectly benefit from its production uh, and, uh, and all these uh, zealots who at least in the beginning uh, favored uh, the ethanol program because it would, uh, uh, it would be a, a slam against uh, oil and uh, oil burning uh, 
vehicles. Well, uh, as often happens, uh, you, you have changes and uh, conditions may change in a way that makes it appear that a policy that was created is no longer politically viable, uh, no longer has the same support, and that happened in the ethanol case because the environmentalists be began after a while to see that the ethanol production and use was actually, as they saw it, harming the environment. It w wasn't the improvement that they thought it would be. They thought, oh, anything you do to reduce the use of uh, oil products is good for the environment. But then they discovered that, that when you in encouraged uh, ethanol production by subsidizing it, and therefore uh, that spilled over into the demand for ethanol inputs, namely corn uh, for the most part, that farmers grew more corn using more pesticide and more fertilizer. And, 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 and there was a more runoff of these things into the waterways, and so that was bad for the environment. So ultimately, they, they turned against the ethanol program, and recently they politicked actively in opposition to it and, and sought to, um, to end this uh, subsidy. But uh, subsidies once put into play are difficult to eliminate. Uh, because of a number of things. One is that there's sim simply political entrenchment. The people who benefit from a policy uh, become closely connected with the people who, who sustain it in the Congress or the state legislature. Uh, they donate to politicians financially and they support them in other ways. And, and, and so politicians don't want to give up that support and benefit they're getting from the interested parties once there are interested parties that have been brought into being. But another thing happens, which is in, in, in a way more innocent, and, and that is something called the transitional gains trap, uh, a name uh, created by Gordon Tulloch, one of the fathers of public choice analysis. What that means is that if you subsidize something, you create a new stream of revenue for the people who own the subsidized asset. And as a result, uh, that asset becomes more valuable. People are willing to pay more for an asset when it has an additional stream of income associated with its ownership. So if you subsidize, say, corn, land suitable for growing corn is bid up in the market. If you subsidize ethanol, these plants that are built to produce ethanol certainly have a higher value than they would have without the subsidy. In fact, in this case, they, they, they would probably have almost no value except junk value, of, you know, hauling away the metal and crushing it up. Because this entire ethanol industry is the product of the subsidies. It barely existed before these subsidies were, were put into operation. But if you create an asset, uh, uh, if you create uh, a, an additional revenue stream and cause the value of assets to be bid up, then people who come along get into the business later, you know, they have to pay that higher asset value to enter the business, even if there's no special gain to them. Even if, you know, now, even with the subsidy coming to them, they don't make an unusual rate of return on producing ethanol. They had to pay to get that revenue stream. So we say that that revenue stream has been capitalized into the price of the asset. And because they've paid for it, uh, they sh sure as hell don't want it taken away from them. They could say, well, we're not guilty of this. You know, I paid full price for this asset, and now if you remove the subsidy, you're gonna remove a revenue stream flowing to this asset, and you're gonna hurt me and so when people anticipate economic hurt, they fight against it. So once you create a government benefit of any kind, you create a, poten a potential uh, transitional gains trap. You get into something, you can't get out of it. That's the trap, okay? And so you have, a, uh, for this and other reasons, you have a kind of ratchet effect, as I call it, in, in the ex expansion of government power. Government power is easier to increase than it is to diminish once it's been created. And it, this takes uh, countless forms, but it's certainly uh, taken that form in, in the, the ethanol case. And uh, of course, at the end of the day, what we have here is a situation very much like others 
in which uh, the benefits of this program are highly concentrated, uh, pretty much just in the form of uh, continued flow of revenue, uh, mostly through tax credits, to people who produce uh, ethanol or purchase it and use it for blending in fuels, which uh, the law also requires them to do in certain amounts. Uh, so there's a mandate to use ethanol, and, and on top of that, uh, the people who, who, who buy it and use it are subsidized to do so with a, with a tax uh, a subsidy and other subsidies. There's a whole list of ethanol-related subsidies in operation, uh, some federal, some state. Uh, all of the states have some form of, of activity that uh, has the effect of subsidizing the use of ethanol. But the upshot of this is we have a massive amount of loss. The ethanol subsidies are worth about $6 billion a year right now, and they're gonna stay there or grow even. And this is the loss of taxpayers, loss of consumers. The ethanol blended gasoline gets worse mileage when you burn it in your car, your truck, and as a result, you end up burning more fuel than you would otherwise to go the same distance. So it's kind of another way of offsetting any gain that the, the old environmentalists thought would flow from using ethanol instead of uh, petroleum-based fuel. And the whole thing is just a disaster, but, uh, but, but it seems impossible now to get rid of it. And in fact, it just happened yesterday. I pulled up <laughs> an article from The Guardian in the, the UK and one, one of the sentences here says, the ethanol mania has verged on the bazaar. And that's certainly true. When you look at this, it's now at the point where the environmentalists hate it, uh, consumers hate it, people who drive cars and trucks hate it. As if, you know, tout le monde hates this thing, but you got a handful of producers uh, who own these ethanol plants. There are now somewhat more than 200 of them in the country, most of them here in the Midwest, uh, and, and you've got a lot larger number of corn farmers. And these are the principal beneficiaries of these subsidies. In fact, it's pretty hard to find anybody else who's gained, except perhaps a few input suppliers uh, for these people. But uh, it's bizarre that this thing exists. Uh, now, people are now trying to get rid of it. And in fact, there was a, a move uh, when it was renewed at the end of last year in Congress uh, that kept it from being renewed for five years, which is what looked as if uh, would follow. But uh, Senator Feinstein uh, uh, and Senator Kyle and about 15 other senators uh, joined forces to, to uh, work in opposition to the renewal of the ethanol subsidies uh, they were not successful, but what happened is that the subsidies, the main one, was renewed only for one year rather than five. So this battle's gonna come up again uh, in about uh, seven months and, and have to be refought again. And, and it may be that one of these days the political forces that oppose this subsidy will, will succeed in, in getting it uh, tossed out. But meanwhile, those who are keeping it alive, uh, you might be able to guess uh, pretty much uh, all the the uh, the senators and representatives from the corn growing states have lined up uh, to back uh, this uh, program. And uh, in fact, I I I found a study uh, by by a, a website called Open Secrets Blog, which which tracks money flowing to politicians from various organized groups and other donors. And uh, it uh, turns out there's a, a lobby you would expect that the senators are collecting uh, very large amounts of donations from Archer Daniels Midland, National Corn Growers Association, uh, an outfit called Poet, uh, which is an ethanol producer uh, from something called Growth Energy, that's another one of them, and from Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. So, you know, all the direct beneficiaries of this program are lined up giving tons of money to, to, to Chuck, Chuck Grassley 
uh, who's the committee chairman that deals with these things. So he gets the most. Uh, but then you have uh, a bunch of other senators and representatives also raking in extraordinarily large amounts of money from these same interested organized political groups. And on the other hand, you have these people I mentioned, uh, the Feinstein-Kyle faction that uh, expressed its opposition recently. And if you look at where their money comes from, voila, of course, they don't get much money at all from, from these uh, groups like the National Corn Growers and, and the Ethanol Producers Associations and what have you. So it's just a, a, a classroom illustration of concentrated benefits, dispersed costs, uh, a lot of ideological smoke being blown across the whole uh, undertaking as usual because nobody wants to come out and say, look, we're robbing you and we can do it so we're gonna. Uh, they never say that. They, they always give you these reasons, and, and they're still standing up in public and talking about how uh, this ethanol uh, subsidy is great for the environment, even though the environmentalist groups no longer agree. Uh, but when Chuck Grassley gives a talk, he talks about how great it is for the environment and how it produces jobs. And every time you say the magic word jobs, you know, pe people fall down like, like they're having an epileptic seizure. Uh, and, and politicians know that, so they keep expressing the mantra, jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, it's like one of Bob Murphy's uh, zombies. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, the, but the jobs zombie, zombie is at work here uh, defending this program and, and also uh, the talk about uh, the programs creating uh, market stability. And this is another one of the, uh, the excuses that have been uh, trotted out time and again to justify agricultural subsidies, going back certainly to uh, the 1920s and 30s, is the idea that if markets are, are left to, to themselves, there's so much volatility that it's horrible. It's horrible not only for the producers, it's horrible for the consumers. They never know what the price is gonna be for the product, so government can intervene and produce stability. Well, uh, my advice to you is whenever you hear anything in politics justified on the grounds that it's there to produce stability, and I don't care whether we're talking about foreign policy or ag policy, you know you're being taken in. That's not what it's for. Follow the money. Thanks.